Good evening, everyone. You're here. We have been looking forward to this very moment for over a year. It's wonderful to see so many friends. Some of you I haven't seen since the Henson Lectures. Uh, others I've only met via Zoom, and you know who you are. And then all of the new friends that I've met this evening and that I have been meeting over the year that we have been putting this event together. I am Susan Lockwood, and I'm the chair of the William M. Johnson Lecture Series. And it is my great joy and great honor to welcome you to Glad Reunion celebrating the ministry and legacy of John R. Claypool. And we're also very happy tonight that we're live streaming. Uh, the entire conference will be available virtually, and so we want to welcome those who are joining us this evening virtually. Thank you for being here, all of you. Now, if you've seen one bit of publicity on this event, you know that this is being brought to you by Crescent Hill Baptist Church. And this is one of 10 series the church has offered since 2011 with Bill Thomason over until just this year when I went insane and said, yes, I would chair this committee. And Bill has been so ably uh, guiding this series of, of events over the years. Bill, would you just stand up so we can see who you are? Here. All right. The idea for holding an, uh, some lectures, which has become an annual event, uh, was the result of an anonymous donation that was made to Crescent Hill Church, and it was made in honor of William M. Johnson, better known as Johnson, better known as Bill Johnson. At the time was uh, one of the ministers of the church, and you will see him around the church now because he's moved from to facilities ministry and manager. So he's in charge of the chairs, tables, trash, lights, and the list goes on. So we, we honor Bill every time we have one of these, and we are grateful that he is still active and still a minister in our congregation. Now, beyond honoring Bill with an event bearing his name and uh, this event is important for some other reasons as well. First of all, I don't know about you, but it's wonderful to get together with people after two years of so much separation with the pandemic. Wouldn't you agree? And while we are meeting again, uh, in person as a church, we still feel the impact and tentacles of COVID. In fact, one of our committee members, Frank Vaughan, uh, who has done such a wonderful job in shepherding the content portion of the event, came down with COVID this week. And so uh, to match uh, in groups where we're sort of close with each other. So uh, we would just want to keep each other safe. But the event and the person whose ministry we are and exploring, John Claypool, are important because tonight and throughout this weekend, we are lifting up progressive Christianity progressive theology, and progressive Baptist churches, ministers, pastors, laypersons, and seminaries. Progressive in front of Baptist is no longer an oxymoron in this group. 
John Claypool led the way in this movement. For one thing, he elevated the place of social justice in the church life and practice. We will hear about his advocacy for civil rights wherever he served and his advocacy for equality of women in church leadership and ministry, and also his willingness to take the heat for prophetic preaching and actions. He also led the way with his ecumenism and interfaith relationships. He led the way with his preaching, seeking authenticity in the pulpit and foregoing pat theological answers, preferring instead to struggle with tough issues and experiences, and then to understand sometimes we must just accept the ultimate reality that we are all part of and surrounded by great mystery. John, who led the way uh, also in worship, not just preaching, following the practices of the church year. We're going to hear about Christmas and Advent. And you will just hear many more things about some of these topics that I have touched on over the weekend and much, much more. The kinds of things that John Claypool dedicated himself and his ministry to blazed a path that kept many of us from leaving the Baptist church, leaving the Baptist life, and becoming, oh, well, I don't know, maybe an Episcopalian. <laughs> of course, that was John's chosen path, but that in no way detracts from what we knew, know, or will learn of him as a Baptist, because making that move also blazed another path for us to ponder, I think. That being a Baptist, I really hope it won't be too offensive, isn't everything. Being true to who we are and how we experience the divine presence is far more important. And that we can, without recrimination, leave that country, that far country that rejects us, to find a new home that will embrace us with grace and hope. We are so grateful for the participation and presence of our Episcopalian friends and uh, the friends of John Claypool who are here. Now you will hear, as I said, a lot about these aspects of John Claypool's ministry as the program unfolds. But this would not happen without a tremendous outpouring from the presenters and facilitators who are here with us over the weekend. We are so very, very fortunate to have such a distinguished group of facilitators and presenters. They've made time in their very busy schedules and many have had to travel a distance to be here. And let's face it, they aren't really receiving big bucks for this, if at all. But they're here because they have something important to share about John Claypool and his ministry. And they want to invite you into the conversation. So we hope that you will participate. And if you are one of our presenters or facilitators, would you be so kind as to stand so we might see who you are and people can uh, find you and speak to you if they would like. I would also like to thank the Johnson Lecture Committee. Uh, would you please stand if you are a member of the committee? Now, some of them are downstairs working, so. Okay, does it? <laughs> uh, 
They, they of course, are available to help you with during this weekend. They're available to answer questions and help you in any way. If you want to make a critical comment, tell them. Compliment the, the event, tell me. I would also like to say that we are indebted to our many sponsors because we would not be able to put on an event of this scale if it were not for their generous contributions. So uh, we have a list in your folder. I hope you will uh, look at that and see who they are uh, because without them, we would be uh, just doing much less during the weekend. So we thank them very much. Thank you, sponsors. But it really wasn't just the eight of us on the committee that brought this weekend into being. We want to thank our church staff for all they have done and are doing and going to continue to do over this weekend. We want to thank our technology crew. They've worked very, very hard to get the live stream sound in place. We want to thank all of our volunteers. Uh, we also want to include in our volunteers Jennifer LeBeau and Maggie Thomas from Broadway Baptist, Just filling uh, those uh, plastic bags, stuffing folders, anything. Would you please stand? I do need to do just a few housekeeping items, uh, and I promise I'm just almost done, but I do need to cover that and uh, say just a couple of more words. Uh, I want to say that the uh, reception after be back down in Birchwood Lobby, it will not be in Heritage Hall. We printed the programs before we made uh, wonderful hors d'oeuvres. I mean, there's even mac and cheese down there, so uh, that sounds really good to me. So anyway, I hope you'll join us and, and mingle. It'll be a bit of a tight space, but we're going to open the doors and you can go outside and you can just around the church. We've got a lot of facility here. So just make yourself at home and enjoy yourself. Uh, some of you may have known Wood Lobby, so if you'd like to purchase uh, any of John Claypool's book, I, books, I think they have a, an excellent selection, including the one that, that we are, uh, that is being released and that we are following for the content of this weekend. Uh, also, registration will reopen downstairs in uh, Birchwood Lobby, so feel free if you haven't had a chance to register to go down there and register. One last clarification, just in case you, you were so diligent, you brought from home, we used to have Jordan Conley, who was just called Jordan as one of our two co-pastors in July. He was ordained by... <laughs> he was ordained by Crescent Hill, I believe about a year ago. I sat on his ordination council. And he is a recent graduate of Baptist Seminary of Kentucky. Jordan and I shared something in common we are both from Eastern Kentucky. Now, New York and Chicago have wiped out some of the accent, but we are both from Eastern Kentucky, and we're about as Appalachian as you can get. Jordan came on late in the game as we prepared for Glad Reunion, but he has offered his help willingly and graciously and has been great to work with. 
If you don't meet her tonight, you will have the opportunity to meet our other co-pastor, Andrea Woolley, tomorrow and on Sunday. Before Jordan comes, there's one more uh, thank you that I want to make. And I want to, uh, I would be remiss not to thank Ron Claypool for all that he has committed to this uh, weekend, for all that he has contributed, for all of his connections, for all of his pre-thoughts that have driven me crazy, for, for, for all that he has invested in, for the love of his father uh, that shows forward. Uh, in the things that he has wanted to see happen in this weekend. So uh, thank you so much, Rowan. And I also like to call him an instigator. Uh, I'd like now uh, to have Jordan come forward, say anything he would like, and then lead us in our opening prayer. You know, I may be new, but Susan, I've been around long enough to know that you don't invite a Baptist preacher to come up behind the pulpit just to say whatever they like. <laughs> That's a risky move. On behalf of all of the members of Crescent Hill Baptist Church, I would like to welcome each of you to this evening and this special weekend. I know that for many of you, this weekend is a homecoming. And so on behalf of the members of Crescent Hill Baptist Church, myself and Andrea Woolley, my co-pastor, I would like to say, welcome home. And as we'd say back home in Eastern Kentucky, before you leave this weekend, I hope that you get a blessing out of your time here. Would you join me now for a word of prayer? Eternal and everlasting God, we come together for this glad reunion with hearts full of gratitude. In a spirit of thanksgiving, we echo the praise of the psalmist who said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. With our hearts held high amid this great cloud of witnesses, we invoke your spirit upon this place. As you promised the people of Israel that you would dwell in their midst, we call upon your Spirit, O God, to dwell among us this evening. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. May this, our glad reunion, provoke our hearts to become liberators. For your Spirit has anointed us to preach good news to the poor, to set the captive free. Revive us again, O God, that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. In the name of Christ, our way we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jordan, and uh, special thanks to Susan. Um, you just can't know how many hours Susan has put into this event, and I'm so grateful for it. And uh, her skill and her tenacity and her thoroughness have brought us to this point, and uh, she, and I think, had wonderfully complementary skills, which means she had a lot of skills and I had a few skills. And uh, that balanced us out just fine. But um, I want to amen and echo all of her words of gratitude and thanks. There are so many people that have had oars in the water and digging deep uh, for this event. And I'm very, very grateful for it. 
Also want to say this is a special family gathering for us. I want to say welcome to my stepmother, Anne, and her husband, Myron. Uh, they've come from Colorado from a long way away to be with us, and I'm grateful to have them here. Uh, my wife and then all of our children are here. My son, John, his fiance, Susie, Will, and Catherine. Uh, there's a three-year-old uh, who's at home, who's the star visit, of course, and then uh, Melanie's younger son, Taylor, and his wife, Maggie, will be joining us uh, tomorrow. Um, so when we think about this weekend, there really were four significant guiding phrases or terms uh, that led us in our intentionality for how we would approach this task. These all relate, I think, to Dad's ministry and career. The first one was illumination, fellowship, inspiration, and benediction. Illumination. We have built this into the content of the weekend through the presentations of the authors to the Claypool book. Um, I'm so grateful that Doug and Aaron Weaver picked up the baton at Dr. Glenn Henson's Johnson Lectures, heard sight, and be willing to write their piece of Dad's history. Uh, and that book has just come out, and I'm very, very grateful to all those uh, we're going to have the chance to hear folks as panelists talk about their respective uh, assessments of tenures. Uh, Dad served in different churches and also some of the major themes in his career. So that is our illumination. Fellowship. My dad loved nothing better than being with people and breaking bread with them. Uh, it was his greatest joy and what energized him above all else. In fact, every time we would get in the car to start for him, that we were going to break bread and be together in a meal. So uh, this notion of glad reunion, of being together, of being able to visit with each other and experience each other again in person is critically important. So that fellowship uh, is very important in leading this. Inspiration. We really do not want this to be a backward-looking reminiscence of a career that is over, but rather taking what my father did and bringing it to the current day and projecting it forward. We want his career and his work and the body of that effort over 50 plus years to be relevant. So we've built in time to think about what John Claypool would say to us today and then project that and carry that forward. There will be a number of different ways in which we do that. We're inviting your participation in that experience. You'll have a sheet in your packet that talks about the ways in which you can participate. Uh, and then structurally on Sunday morning during the Sunday school hour, uh, Steve Shoemaker and Will Ratliff are gonna facilitate a discussion of what John Claypool would say to us today. There is a series of post-it notes in Fellowship Hall. You're invited to write your thoughts on what John Claypool would say. You can write a lot of thoughts. Don't feel limited. And then Steve and Will will take those and use them for the basis of our discussion Sunday morning. Benediction. The closing of this event will focus deeply on Dad's iconic benediction, and I'm so grateful that David Hall is going to lead us in that deeper exploration. Dad's, and just like you talked about Jordan and blessing, Dad's benediction really functioned as a blessing, more than a close of the service, more than the end of the worship hour, it became the blessing. I can tell you for my whole life, people have told me that they came to church just to hear the benediction. So Sunday morning, we're gonna have a time to really explore the depth and the importance of that iconic statement for which I'm so grateful. So that's how we develop the content and the experience of this weekend. We're so grateful that you have all come from so far away and brought your piece of John's history 
and going to share it with us. I think it's a great, great blessing. After Greg finishes singing, I want to, we're going to turn the program over to Dr. Kevin Cosby. He is a well-known and familiar guest to this pulpit. Uh, we are honored to have him uh, talk about uh, John Claypool as preacher and civil rights leader. Uh, Dr. Cosby is the senior minister at St. Stephen's Baptist Church. He's been there for 40 years, a bright and shining light in our community, a prophetic man in the pulpit. Uh, and then, I guess more recently, in the last 15 or so years, the president of Simmons College, uh, the only private SBCU in the state of Kentucky, and he is put, putting his shoulder to the wheel every single day to give opportunities to uh, the candidates that come and the students that come to that HBCU to find a better future in this community and this state. So we're very grateful to have him in the pulpit and we're gonna turn it over to Greg. Thank you all for being here. voice and sing till earth and heaven ring ring with the harmonies of liberty let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies let it resound loud as the rolling seas. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun till a new day begun. Let us march on till victory is won. Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod. Felt in the days when hope unborn had died, yet with a steady beat, have not a weary feet come to the place for which our parents. have come over a way that with tears has been slaughtered. We have come treading a path through the blood of the slaughtered. Out from the gloomy past till we are stand where the white gloom of a bright star is cast. God of our weariness, God of our silent tears, Thou who has brought us thus far on the way. Thou who has by thy might led us into the light. Keep us forever in the past. 
Our God, where we met thee, lest our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Whenever I hear James Weldon Johnson's lift every voice and sing, I know what the psalmist meant when he said that deep calleth unto deep. And never more so like whenever I hear Brother Gregory's rendition of that sacred hymn. I like that song a whole lot better forgive me for saying it, than the Star Spangled Banner. <laughs> and the reason I say that is because Francis Scott Key was an unapologetic slave owner. Not only was he a slave owner, but he believed that if blacks were free, that they needed to be colonized outside the United States. We love to sing the Star Spangled Banner, the verse one, but verse three, you ought to check it out. Verse three talks about the time when the British had offered the enslaved freedom if they would join the ranks of the British Army. And many joined the, the British because they wanted true freedom, which was deprived them in the United States, I mean States of America. So he celebrated slavery in verse three. If you don't believe me, check my secretary, Miss Google. <laughs> and in verse three, it reads, no refuge can save the harling or slave from the terror or flight or the gloom of the grave. That's verse three of our national anthem. But lift every voice is democratic. Lift every voice and sing. There are not enough adjectives in the lexicon of human speech to express my gratitude for this opportunity to just be connected with John Claypool. I want to thank uh, Susan. Uh, she is a very um, determined and persistent woman. <laughs> and to Brother Jordan, please consider me your friend and brother. Congratulations, man. And to Rowan, God bless you, friend, for keeping your father's legacy alive. What a preacher. Anytime you hear John Claypool preach, if you are a preacher, you wonder if you have been called to preach. <laughs> I mean, just outstanding. And he was a courageous preacher. He was a bold preacher. He was not as Jeremiah Wright would say, not pathetic, but prophetic. He spoke truth to power. He dared to look at life through the lens 
of the marginalized, the dispossessed, the disenfranchised. Jesus said, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. But Jesus never said that the truth would make you comfortable. And unfortunately today, we want a comfortable truth, a convenient truth. And John Claypool, during his preaching ministry, was not looking for comfortable, convenient truth. He was a part of that great pantheon of prophetic preachers in the white Baptist, Southern Baptist tradition, like Henley Barnett, my professor and mentor, Dr. Glenn Stassen, um, that great prophet from America's Georgia, Clarence Jordan, <laughs> Samuel DeWitt Proctor <clears throat> was the pastor of the Abyssinian Church in New York, <laughs> tells a story about um, Clarence Jordan, who was supposed to preach up in Michigan. And everyone was looking for Jordan. They thought he was going to come by way of train. He didn't come by way of train. They thought he perhaps would show up by way of plane. He didn't show up by way of plane or train or bus. Instead, right when it was time for him to mount the, the pulpit, Clarence Jordan came dusty on a motorcycle. Then he rode a motorcycle all the way from America's Georgia up to Michigan. And he had just one thing in his hand, and that was a copy of the Greek New Testament from which he preached um, extemporaneously on the Sermon on the Mount for an hour. And when it was over, they had a time of dialogue with Dr. Jordan, and one minister raised his hand and asked Clarence Jordan, how can an urban, modern pastor preach the Sermon on the Mount and still be successful? And Clarence Jordan said, well, you got to know that when Jesus preached and taught the Sermon on the Mount, he was not talking to modern urban pastors who want to be successful. He was preaching to his disciples. So I guess you got to decide whether or not you want to be a modern urban successful pastor or whether you want to be a disciple. John Claypool was not concerned about being a modern, urban, successful pastor. John Claypool wanted to be a disciple. And this, being a disciple will get you in trouble. But that's the kind of prophet that John Claypool was. And I appreciate what Rowan said, our, our purpose is not simply to just venerate him, but our purpose is to continue the great work of John Claypool in our generation. So having said that, I want to read a passage to you from the book of 1 Corinthians. Chapter 15, verse 29. Now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? And I'd like to add just one other um, historic piece from Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. It's interesting 
that when asked the question, who freed the slaves, if we say Lincoln, that's because we're historically illiterate. Lincoln didn't free the slaves. Who freed the slaves? The slaves freed the slaves. Because when the Emancipation Proclamation was issued on January the 1st, 1863, 210,000 former slaves joined the Union Army. Another 200 former slaves participated in covert activities to destabilize the Confederacy. Without the workforce of the enslaved, um, the Confederacy could not maintain and sustain its war effort. So the Emancipation Proclamation was issued January the 1st, 1863, and Gettysburg, uh, the Battle of Gettysburg turned back the forces of Northern Virginia. And it was that same year that the Emancipation Proclamation took place and the Battle of Gettysburg that the Union began to win. But as he dedicated the graveyard, Lincoln, in his Gettysburg Address, this is what he said which is what Rowan alluded to. It is for us the living rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which Claypool, which they, which Henley Barnett, which Clarence Jordan, it is for us the living rather than to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. Baptize for the dead. This is one of those obscure, isolated passages that has been the source of much misinterpretation. Our, Mo our Mormon brothers and sisters cite this passage as the foundation for their practice of proxy baptism. Proxy baptism is the belief that a living person can be baptized for an undead or unbaptized dead person so the dead person might obtain salvation. Now the very uh, important principle in biblical hermeneutics is whenever you have an unclear passage, you might wanna use a clear passage to help you understand it. For example, two clear passages I would like to cite is, um, one is John chapter one and verse 12. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become the children of God. Something you cannot get by proxy. I can exercise for you, but you will still be out of shape. I can take medicine for you, but you will still be sick. I can go to sleep for you, but you will still be tired. I can take mouthwash for you, but you will still have breath of hoses. <laughs> and the same is true when it comes to salvation. Salvation is not something that is transferred. It is always something that is personal. What makes the psalm so powerful are the personal pronouns. Not the Lord is a shepherd, but the Lord is my shepherd. Not the Lord is a light and a salvation, but the Lord is my light and my salvation. If I were to take a picture of this group and it was to appear in the New York Times, this room, 
and you knew that the picture of us would be in the New York Times, you would go to that picture first after getting the New York Times, and the first person you would look for in the picture <laughs> is you, because it's personal. So salvation is personal. And a second clear passage is Hebrews 9.27. It is appointed unto man, to humankind, once uh, to die and then the judgment. Not death and then proxy baptism. Now, I'm, I wrestle with the whole idea of, of whether God evangelizes beyond this world. I, I would have no problem with that personally. Um, Jesus said that the woman kept sweeping for the lost coin, not until the broom wore out, but she kept sweeping for the lost coin until she found the lost coin. But still, even if the lost coin is found, there is something that the lost coin has to do to respond on a personal level to the call of Christ, the claims of Christ in their life. So therefore, what does it mean when it says, baptized for the dead? Well, the key for understanding, I think, this passage is the preposition for, which is ice in the Greek language. And that preposition can mean in behalf of or to give credit to someone. So I'm being baptized to give credit for you. Or the preposition can mean in place of. And I believe that it's the latter. When Paul says in this whole chapter on the resurrection that baptism for the dead is baptism not in behalf of, but I am being baptized in place of. Um, in other words, when I am baptized as a Christian, I am literally, in a sense, taking a dead person's place. Baptism for the dead means that as an old convert dies, and when a new convert is converted, that the new convert, the new person, is supposed to take the place of the old soldier who has died. New Christians are to replenish the ranks of those who've passed on. In every great church, in every great community, in every great family, there is always some outstanding, selfless, John Claypool type of person who over the course of their life begins to decline. They get old, they get feeble, and they will eventually die. The latest statistic on death is one out of every one person dies. <laughs> when a new person was converted and baptized, that new person was considered baptized for the dead because the new convert could potentially take the dead person's place step into the dead person's shoes to take up the dead person's task and carry on the dead person's work so that the work would go on uninterrupted and continuously from generation to generation. To be baptized for the dead means that when you become a Christian and when you are baptized, you become the spiritual, spiritual successor of a deceased person who died in the service of the Lord. You would join the church after baptism and you would 
grasp the mission of the church and perpetuate the work of the church, a work that a previous generation labored to accomplish. One of the signs of a great person is that they give themselves to a cause so great that they cannot accomplish it in their own lifetime. They die before the work is achieved. I think that's one of my great frustrations as both a pastor and especially as the president of a historical black college and university. I want so desperately to see the school in which I am the president, an HBCU, I want to see it successful, not for ego, but because I know that we need in the black community, especially in the California community where I live and serve the California community, which is the poorest zip code in the state of Kentucky, that we need anchor institutions. And I want to see that institution succeed. But I know that the vision that I have for Simmons College, I will not see in my lifetime. That I will grow older and feeble, which is happening right now. Someone said to me, man, you look so good. I said, it's just for man. So because I love the work that I'm doing at Simmons College, I know that one will have to come when I'm dead and be baptized in order to continue the work. In other words, everything that we value, that one day we're going to have to leave into the hands of our sons and our daughters, the next generation. Because when we came into this world, there was unfinished work that we took up. And when we pass off the scene, there will still be unfinished work. And this is what Lincoln was getting at in the Gettysburg Address. When 51,000 people had died in that battle, 51,000 people died in order to bring to America what Lincoln called a new birth of freedom. But the battle for freedom was not over. So Lincoln said, it is for us the living rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. Now I have to be careful here. I have to be very careful here. We should not just indiscriminately take up the work of our ancestors. Some of our ancestors, their work does not need to be continued. Some of our ancestors' work needs to be corrected. Not perpetuated, but terminated. Uh, not carried over, but left behind. But there are some dreams and there are some ideals and great work that must be picked up, carried on, and must not die with one generation. And whenever you pick up great work, like the work of Claypool and F.G. Sampson, who was in this community, partnering together. When you pick up that work, well, guess what you're doing? You've been baptized for the dead. In the area of justice and compassion and racial justice and equity, who will be baptized for the dead? Who will be baptized for the Henley Barnetts and the Martin Luther Kings, for the Malcolm X's? Who will be baptized? We all celebrate the civil rights titans from Rosa Parks to Martin to the Freedom Risers 
to uh, John Lewis. But that generation has passed. And the fight for justice and opportunity is not over. The fight for equity is not over. I know it. I live in West Louisville. This poor, red line, segregated community where I see homeless people living, or houseless people rather, living on the streets. Because the work of King was not finished. I know we think that we're post-racial and colorblind. We live in a colorblind America. No, we're not colorblind, we're history blind. And because we're history blind, we're justice blind. So the question is, it's one thing to admire Dr. King and, have, and celebrate him on King Day and, and Black History Month, but his work is not finished. And when we were baptized, we were baptized for Fannie Lou Hamer to continue her work, to continue the work of Rosa Parks. You were not baptized just to sit. And when you're baptized, never dry off. Stay wet, stay soggy. For we were baptized for the dead when it comes to justice. Who will be baptized for the dead for those who advance education, especially equity in education? When those four million enslaved people were freed. When the Civil War ended in April of 1865, four million people in the South, just 5% literacy. But it was institutions like Simmons that was founded in 1879. In fact, Simmons came into existence through our Baptist Convention, which is the oldest black Baptist convention in the state of, in America, here in Kentucky, the General Association of Colored Baptists, established four months after the end of the Civil War. And they came into existence just for one reason, because the enslaved were prohibited from learning to read and write because education made you unfit as a slave. So they started their school, the Simmons College at the Fifth Street Baptist Church here in Louisville, Kentucky. And they were successful in bringing literacy to the formerly enslaved so that by 1915, 50 years after the Civil War, the year Booker T. Washington passed, 85% of the formerly enslaved were literate. But here we are in 2022 and the work is not complete. There are still so many people who do not have an opportunity to get a good education in our public schools, who don't have access and resources to go into higher education because of the lack of advocacy. And the question is, who will be baptized for the dead? to make sure that all people have an opportunity to be educated. And since we're in church, who will be baptized for the dead of those who belong to the church? Who will be baptized? When, when I was first started at St. Stephen Church, one of the reasons why we grew was because we had a man named K.P. McDade who was on the board of trustees at our church. He lived in our community, but he was a hard worker and he had equipment to move trees. And he would volunteer and he would move the trees and clear the land as our church was growing in space. I said we're in a poor neighborhood, the land was so cheap. And he would clear the land. One day he was up in a tree, K.P. McDade, and was sawing off a branch and fell to his, dead, to his death. And we have not been able to replace him. In these many years, we have not been able to find someone who is baptized for dead K.P. McDade. 
And if our churches are going to become alive and vibrant, then we must have a new generation of church people who will say, it's one thing to talk about Claypool and the icons of our church, but today, who will be baptized for that choir member who just passed? Who will be baptized for those who taught the children and worked in the youth ministry? God did not save us to sit. God saved us to serve to be baptized for the dead. The great dilemma of our day is that in this generation, we do not have enough people who are being baptized for the dead. Two words characterize the Claypool generation. Struggle, sacrifice. Two words characterize our generation. Security and success. This is the soft generation, hot tub religion, easy believism, cheap grace, comfortable pews. We enjoy the benefits for what others have died for, labored for, marched for, went to jail for, got put out for, got put out of Southern Seminary. We, we enjoy the benefits. We inherit the blessings of people who have sacrificed, but we have lost to a great degree that same spirit that produced the blessings that we enjoy today. The spirit, the spirit that built our schools, that spirit that built our churches, that spirit that created the voting rights and public accommodations, that spirit, that great democratic spirit that made America spirit of sacrifice and service. In, a, in the country, talking about Eastern Kentucky, but in the country, they have a saying, which is this, leave the wood pile higher than you found it. In other words, if you take some wood from the wood pile, help yourself. But you should not just be the person that takes wood from the wood pile without going out sometimes and cutting some wood and making sure that the wood pile keeps going. If you've been blessed by the wood pile because a former generation cut the wood, do you think that maybe sometime we should ask ourselves, is there not a tree for me to cut to replenish the wood pile, to make the wood pile higher? And whenever you cut wood to make the wood pile higher, you know what you're doing? You're being baptized for the, bed, for the dead. You're being baptized for the dead. And you know what? I think the greatest lesson I learned, especially as I get older, and I get depressed thinking about it, I become very melancholy. I, I try to be a, a student of history and I live with historical figures. I owe that a lot to Brother Glenn over here, who was my professor. And I live with them. And I'm I, I, when I, I was younger, I thought that we would really see the Basileia Theos, the kingdom of God, that we were moving someplace. And I had a reason to believe that because growing up in the 60s and 
seeing the radical change that took place in our country. But the critical race theorists tell us, no, it's, you'll have a high point and of racial justice and then it will revert back to white domination, white monopolization, that it's baked into the cake. And it's understandable why the critical race theorists would believe that. You have to understand that from 1619 to 2019, 400 years, that's 20 generations. 20 generations from, if, if a generation is 20 years, that's 20 generations from 1619 to 2019. And of those 20 generations, 18 of those generations, whites had white affirmative action. Whites got the Homestead Acts. Whites got the right to vote, except women with the eight passing of the 18th Amendment in the, in the 20th century. Whites had the presumption of innocence and brilliance for 18 generations. When I was born, I was born in a legally segregated America. We've only had two generations, two generations to build institutions and wealth. Two generations. And when asked, well, why are not HBCUs, historical black colleges, like PWIs, predominantly white institutions? Well, because of our historical illiteracy, we will think, well, it's because blacks don't have competency, character, and capacity. But it's not because we don't have competency, character, and capacity. It's because blacks don't have cash, connections, and considerations. It has nothing to do with, with us because when God made us, God was not guilty of creative malfeasance. So as I get older, I see, to be honest, I see things getting worse, especially in the black community. I, I have worked and labored in the hood to bring something good. But in spite of it, I feel like Kennedy who said, Dear God, help me for the ocean is so big and my little boat is so small. And my little boat, what I've tried to do in my 43 years as a pastor and my 18 years as the president of a college, seems so small. But what gives me hope is that I don't have to get it done all in my generation that Abraham believed the promise by faith. And although he did not see it in his generation, he and for our LBGTQI brothers and sisters, and BIPOC people, black indigenous people of color, which is our assignment during this time together to be inspired here learn from John Claypool and then leave here, go to our places and say, you know what, John, I'm going to be baptized. told about John, have a cup of coffee in the canteen, which he did. <laughs> and the next day there was a this white man with four black men in the Courier Journal. When 
I'm wondering, he probably just didn't think about that being a problem. When things started getting rowdy down in the south in the 60s when the, they were having marches and the like and the National Council of Churches sent a man down there to find out what was going on. And he comes back to New York City and he says, uh, this is the best thing I've ever seen in my life. He says, you've got, I mean, every system. And he says, but you know, I've never been able to speak to white people without being, without risking their lives, without being th <clears throat> Well, I'm going to change this just a tad, because I'm going to add another song to it. <laughs> wrote another song called This Land is Your Land. And he wrote this song as a protest to God Bless America, yeah. written by Urban Berlin yeah. and son of Bessie Smith, and it's a big hit. And it was offensive. It ain't great for everybody. Mm. And it ought to be. That's the thing we shall overcome because we don't want to. But I'm hoping you're beginning to realize be a part. the New York Island, from the Redwood Falls to the Gulf Spring Water Highway. I saw above me that endless skyway. I saw below me that golden sea. This land was made for you and me. We'll Sands of her diamond deserts, and our crops, and our property, but we shall overcome. We shall live in peace. We shall overcome. I saw my people as they stood there, her body living. Everyone's focus is on the royal family, but perhaps one of the greatest benedictions ever uttered was by King Henry VI during World War II. The Germans had invaded France and the British troops at Dunkirk. It was a dark time for the British people. But he pronounced this benediction, but this is what he said. I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, 
Give me a light that I might tread safely into the unknown. And he said to me, into the hand of God. And God shall be for thee better than a light and safer than a known way. And safer than a known way. Amen.